السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We commence in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى Most gracious, most merciful We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم His household, his companions We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to bless them all and to bless every one of us to accept from us the fasting and the prayer that we are engaging in in the evenings and the change in lifestyle for the better that we have done during the month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep it a permanent change. Amen. My brothers and sisters, you know, when you see a scholar of Islam, when you see an imam of a masjid, when you see a person teaching hifm, when you see someone teaching the Arabic language, the Quran and the Hadith, you would not expect him to be driving the latest S-Class Mercedes. Am I right? You would not expect him to be having the best house in Rylands, nor would you expect him to be a millionaire. Unfortunately, we have a sickness, and this sickness runs down from centuries. We believe that those who are religious or those who are teaching the religious are not supposed to be paid beyond 50,000 rands a month. Is that right? Everyone is quiet. You're shocked. <laughs> if it was the case, we would quit our jobs and become sheikhs, right? What we believe is, and unfortunately, it's a reality. I'm talking about reality with due respect to everybody. Sometimes that a person teaching hifz is supposed to get the minimum wage or a little bit more than that. Their children are supposed to be going to public schools or they are supposed to be driving a Camry. I don't know if that is still the case. They are supposed to be people who perhaps should not have lots of money. They should not be wearing a Rolex, nor should they be having a Mont Blanc, nor should they be having anything that is expensive. It's a sickness. If they do, what's he doing, man? He must be stealing. He must be doing this. He must be pinching. He must be pushing drugs and so on. This is the reality. People believe from a long time and you know what? If you want to teach religion, you've got to be a pauper. As a result, we have no respect for those who teach our children the Quran. Yet, khayrukum man ta'allama al-Qur'ana wa allamahu. The best from amongst you are those who teach the Quran and who, who learn it and teach it. The best. So better than your doctors, your accountants, your rocket scientists. The hadith says, the best. Those who learn the word of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and teach it. How ironic, subhanallah, subhanallah. I told you all due respect to those of other fields. We tend to consider the statement that ulama make as something low because for us, they are worth being handed out little handouts to. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. The day that changes and the day the salary of the ulama is at par with the doctors and the professionals and those who are PhD holders, etc., that's the day we would have some respect for the scholars of the deen. When they talk, we would listen. When they say, we would go to hear what they have to say. And we would take serious what they are teaching. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Many children, they look up to people, I want to be like this uncle. Do you know why they do it? Today we are living in a materialistic world. Let's not fool ourselves. The children do it because they see us admiring the vehicle of this person, the clothing, perhaps the perfume, perhaps the phone, perhaps everything else, perhaps the house, not realizing that in a lot of cases, it's still being paid. The mortgage is still being paid. And the person really owns nothing. It's just a show. But the children want to be like that because we've trained them subconsciously sometimes that you know what? That is the life. That is success. Such that subhanallah, when someone proposes to marry our child, we take a look at monetary living and the level of finance before we look at the deen and the religion. It has happened. It's already happening in society. Now, why do I start this way? I start this way because we were speaking about some of the points of confusion that the kuffar of Makkah tried to create regarding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to try and divert the rich people and the wealthy and the powerful of Makkah from listening to what he had to say. So they started creating confusions. If you look at Surah Al-Furqan, which is Surah number 25 of the Quran, verse number 7, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of one of these issues they tried to create. Like I told you, it's come down the generations. وَقَالُوا مَا لِهَذَا الرَّسُولِ يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامَ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقُ لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مَلَكٍ فَيَكُونَ مَعَهُ نَذِيرًا أَوْ يُلْقَى إِلَيْهِ كَنْزٍ أَوْ تَكُونُ لَهُ جَنَّةٌ يَأْكُلُ مِنْهَا وَقَالَ الظَّالِمُونَ إِنْ تَتَّبِعُونَ إِلَّا they said, what is it with this man who claims to be a messenger, yet he is walking in the marketplaces and he eats food just like everyone else? What's wrong? He's supposed to be different, just like what we say. He's supposed to be different. How can he go into the marketplace? He's supposed to be sitting and teaching the kids. How can he have a deal that is bigger than our deal? How come he got the million and we only got a hundred thousand? This is what happens. And it happened from then. They picked or they tried to pick on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, how could he eat food? Why? Imagine you enter a restaurant and the rich and famous come and purchase food worth a thousand rands. And here comes the sheikh from down the road in the masjid. And he purchased worth five thousand rands. They look at him and he literally, as they notice what he's done, subhanallah, more generous, he's got more money and so on. They wouldn't feel right because some balance has gone amiss in our society if that was the case. Okay? It's a fact. I know some people might feel hurt. It's not to make people feel hurt. It's to make us think. I'm sure my colleagues would be proud of what I said today because they face a challenge even for the school fees of their own children. Their children are not supposed to go to the private schools and colleges. Why? Because your father is an imam. That's it. It's a fact. We feel somehow that these people are not entitled at all to anything to do with this world. You know what? They're human. They also need a phone. They also need cars. They also need houses. They also have family members. They have children. Subhanallah. Sometimes their children excel in worldly living such that they go way beyond the wealthiest of society. And the father was just an imam. I know examples of that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. So they said, what is it with this man? He actually eats food like what we all do. And how could he be eating food? If he was really a messenger, he should have an angel with him who looks after his affairs. An angel. You know, you should be sitting in the masjid. The angel does everything. You know what? The ulama also need to interact in the marketplace. They also need to buy and sell. They also need to sometimes. They also need to go to the doctor. They also need to meet their needs. Their families also want to go on a holiday. It doesn't mean that because they are scholars of the deen that their, family can, their families can forget about going out on a holiday or about even going out to eat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So in the case of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they were trying to tell the people of Makkah that this man is not a messenger because he's just like us. Yet he was not like them. He was a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they said, why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send an angel to be warning together with him, all the people, hey, I'm an angel, this is a messenger. It's not going to come your way. You cannot decide when you have the examination paper at your final exams, why didn't the teacher write the answer at the back of the paper? That was the examination. The answer was given to you prior to the test, not during the test. So we have the answer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot choose and decide what Allah should have and shouldn't have done. The test was decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the second thing they said is, if Allah willed, he should have kept for him a huge treasure. Or he should have had a separate garden from all ours, from which he could eat and consume the best of food. When we saw that, we would then be able to follow. Now remember, these are all excuses. What shaitan does, when shaitan does not want you to listen to something correct, he makes you find fault in the person so that you can ignore the message. And this is why I always say, the difference between the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the ulama is that the Prophet was infallible. He was pure. He was perfect. But the ulama, they, there is a human factor in them that makes them err. They may do things that may not be correct. They may even make mistakes. They would probably even commit sin to a certain extent. 
And community never forgives this. Community looks at them as though you are supposed to be a prophet of Allah. For you to make a mistake, no way, it cannot be. Yes, I do agree, there are levels of errors, levels of mistakes. Beyond a certain point, one might want to take a look at that issue and resolve it in a more serious matter. But my brothers, my sisters, you will find a few discrepancies. One day, perhaps you might have a scholar of Islam. He has arrived two minutes late for the salah. Salah was supposed to commence at 5.45 and he was here at 5.47. I promise you, that is the test of those who are behind him. I recall once in Johannesburg this happened. And the Imam, may Allah grant him Jannatul Firdaus, he's passed away. He told me two minutes, I was late. And when I got up, the people started, I could hear voices at the back. You know, the people all want to make a noise, late, late. He said, I have led you in salah for so many years. Today, I was slightly late. Imagine the punctuality. So many years I've led you in salah. One day I'm late and look at what you are doing. Whereas from among you, every day there are late comers. You turn around, there will be rows of people who stand up, especially when it comes to Salatul Fajr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, protect us from these type of standards that are double standards. So once in a while, we need to overlook. Yes, if it happens on a regular basis, you may want to deal with it differently. Gently remind, you know, Imam, mashallah, and this is if you're in authority. And you say it in a very humble way, very polite way, treating the Imam like a VIP because that's what he is. Allah says he's doing the best possible job. And here we are mowing over them as though they are just mere lawn. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, انظر كيف ضربوا لك الأمثال فضلوا. Take a look at how they have made examples, what type of examples, and what they are saying about you. They are indeed gone astray as a result. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, as a result of that, فلا يستطيعون سبيلا. Because of that, they will not be able to find that path. Like I said yesterday. When you look at the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the eyes of sincerity, you will be guided. But when you look at him with the eyes of hatred, what do you expect besides misguidance? Subhanallah. So the same applies to the message of the deen. Look at it with an open heart. Look at it with a beautiful eye and you will find the guidance. You will realize what that message holds in value for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Listen to what Allah says to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best of creation, the most noble of all prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says to him, Tabaraka alladhi in sha'a ja'ala laka khayran min thalika jannat. Glory be to Allah. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah willed, he could have given you even better than what they say you should be having. He could have given you gardens, plush gardens with everything. Allah says if Allah wanted, he could have given it to you. So why didn't Allah give it to him? For many reasons. One of them is, what is the test? If there is evidence in front of you to prove something and we claim, I believe. What do you believe? You've seen it, it's in front of you. If I were to tell you how many fingers is this, and you say two, you saw the fingers. But if I told you, for, a, for example, two days later, how many fingers did I put up? Those who say two will have to believe, be believed by those who didn't see it, right? And those who believe the ones who have seen it are indeed from among those who trust them. They trust them. Otherwise, you wouldn't believe them. So the point I want to raise is, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam had an angel with him, telling everyone, hey, this is a messenger, what was the point of testing the belief? It was in front of them. But Allah says, hang on, we're going to send him, we're going to send him with the signs, we want you to use your brain, and we want you to believe, and belief will entail an aspect of the unseen. Believe him. When he tells you that this is what Allah said, see, do you f find it in your heart to believe that? If you do, you are true. 
If you don't, what was the point of claiming that I bear witness Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger when whatever he has said, we're not even prepared to believe it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I hope we've understood this point. The point being raised is connected to belief in that which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa brought with the evidence that is enough already. We don't need to ask for a supply of greater evidence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding and grant us correctness of iman and yaqeen, faith and conviction. Amin. So, verse number 11 of Surah Al-Furqan speaks about another very interesting aspect. We need to save ourselves, my brothers and sisters, from the fire. We are believers, aren't we? We believe there is heaven and hell. We believe that we would like heaven and we would like to stay away from hellfire. So that is why Allah gives us prohibitions and he has laid down that which is obligatory. Both of those. He wants you to do things, he wants you to abstain from things. And in the middle, he has kept what is known as repentance so that you can always come back and you can always have hope in this paradise that he has prepared and have hope in being saved from hellfire. But there are some who don't believe. They don't believe. So the people at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a lot of them used to say, مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا We have nothing besides this life where we are just living, we will die and we are alive. Which means I'm living now, I make the most of what I can for now because I'm going to die. When I die, there is nothing remaining. It's over. Let me enjoy as much as I can right now. I'm sure you know the statement YOLO or you only live once. The idea behind it is just do everything. Do whatever you want. Well, if you believe that there is a hereafter, you believe that you don't only live once. You live more than once. Once now and later on there is another life. Life after death. And if you believe in that, you prepare during this time for that particular time. Now, if someone did not believe at all, why should he be irritated when others believe? I give you an example. The Prophet wasallam recited the verses connected to the Akhirah and connected to hellfire and the burning in hellfire and the punishment of hellfire. So Allah says, بَلْ كَذَّبُوا بِالسَّاعَةِ Indeed, they have belied the hour. They don't believe in the hour. They don't believe that there is a last day. وَأَعْتَدْنَا لِمَنْ كَذَّبَ بِالسَّاعَةِ سَعِيرًا We have prepared a burning blaze for those who don't believe in the hereafter. Pause there. They got upset. They got angry. Why would they get angry when they don't believe in the hereafter? This is the irony. So a person says, I believe there is nothing to come after death. Well then, no matter what I believe, why does it irk you? Why are you so worried? Why is it when we talk of heaven and hell, do you get excited? You don't even believe that after death there is anything. So if you are worried about it, it means deep down you actually do believe. Subhanallah. You get the point? And this is why once I was sitting with an atheist. And he was so angry and upset about our belief in the hereafter. And I told him exactly this, that you should be the last person talking. You don't even believe that there is anything coming after this. You don't believe. So why are you so worried? He says, but it's nasty. You know, you're blackmailing the people. And I said, that's not true. Nobody is blackmailing anyone. For those who believe, this is what they believe. Those who don't believe, don't believe. That's it. And we will keep on preaching and you can keep on preaching. And that's what the world is all about. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So the point I want to raise is when someone gets upset about the hereafter and what is prepared for those who believe, in essence, deep down, they actually do believe that there is a life after death. That's why they are so worried. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So to save ourselves, we know that yes, there is hellfire. We will do good deeds so that inshallah we can be saved from hellfire and we will seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are human beings. Now every time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the burning blaze of hellfire or he speaks about the punishment that he has prepared for those who transgress immediately before or after, he speaks about paradise, the goodness, the forgiveness, the beauty that has been prepared for those who repent, for those who believe. So this is why immediately after that, Allah asks a question. Verse number 15, Surah Al-Furqan. 
قل قل meaning say O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم to them أذلك خير أم جنة الخلد التي وعد المتقون is that burning blaze better or is Heaven, Jannah, the gardens of paradise, better that have been promised to the muttaqoon. The muttaqoon are those who are conscious of their maker. If you're conscious of your maker, you become a muttaqi. You become a pious person. So that is why taqwa is translated as piety. A person who fears the punishment of Allah, a person who loves Allah enough to stay away from haram, and a person who loves Allah enough to fulfill whatever Allah has asked him or her to fulfill. That is a muttaqi. Allah says, if you are a muttaqi, for you is heaven. As soon as your eyes close, in fact, just before your eyes close, you would be from among those who's given glad tidings by the angels of a good place and a good abode that you are going to go to. Amazing. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what he says? And I need to spend a long time on this. Verse number 16. Of Surah Al Furqan. Lahum fiha ma yashaun khalidin kan ala rabbika wa'adam mas'ula. Those who have entered paradise, for them in it shall be whatever they desire. And Allah says in the next verse, this is a promise. That you can hold against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can hold him. Imagine Allah himself is telling you, you can ask me. Oh Allah, you promised me that I would get whatever I wish. Allah says, wa'dan mas'ulan. It is a promise that is questionable. Meaning question, you can question the person. In this case, the deity, Allah himself is promising. If I say, ana mas'ul, that means I'm responsible. So Allah is responsible to give you. Anything you wish. Now pause there for a moment. This should solve our problem. What problem? Many people ask, what am I going to get in heaven? You know, the people, the men get the hur. What do the women get? Relax. Whatever you want, you're going to get it. Trust me. Anything you want. Now we start saying, okay, that means my cat is going to be with me. That means the dog is going to be with me because I want that. That means uh, not this guy here, but the guy down the road. I want to be with him in paradise. And that means that, you know, I need to have this car. What's the latest vehicle? Can someone say one of the latest cars that they are today? Can anyone make mention of one? Okay, Lexus 2018. Okay, that's a clever one. Say S-Class, BM, whatever, 2018 model. My brothers, that is such a cheap dua. So cheap. Can I explain why? Bring in the Bugattis and the Lamborghinis and the Ferraris. Trust me, in one or two years, they'll be outdated. Outdated. Imagine the people who died in 1930. Oh Allah, I'd love to have this Mercedes that has come out. The latest model. Ya Allah, I'm going to work hard when I get to Jannah. I need it. Relax. Those 1931 Mercedes, no one wants to see them today. Besides those who deal in vintages. If the... If the Car is of a good condition. No one wants it. So it's a wrong dua. The dua is actually way beyond that. If Allah says, I'll make you happy, it means with whatever is there, completely in front of you, way beyond what your imagination can think of. This is why the hadith describes this. You see, people get upset. I've heard women say, you know, men are promised so much. We're not even promised much. I'm not even bothered. I'm not interested. And now I don't want to read my salah anymore. I've actually heard statements of that nature. May Allah safeguard us. It's a pity because they don't realize this verse. And I've just mentioned it. Verse number 16. Go and read it. Of Surah Al-Furqan. Allah says, he promises whatever you wish for. That's what you will have in Jannah Al-Firdaus. So what you got to do is only one thing. Make sure you get there. That's it. There's nothing else you need to worry about. Once you are there, trust me, everything will fall in place. You may never think of your cat because there might be something else way beyond those kittens, subhanallah. You may never think of the cars that were in the world because subhanallah, there is something way beyond in terms of mode of transport, if any. I don't know. We, we can only say what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Fiha ma la ra'at. وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ 
in paradise is that which no ear has ever heard about. No eye has ever seen. Way beyond whatever your eyes have seen. What have you seen? The most beautiful of men or women, depending on whether you're a male or female. Jannah is way beyond. Imagine a dude pitches up and that's your husband. You'll say, oh Allah. <laughs> oh Allah. And he is the don, subhanallah. And you're just looking. <laughs> subhanallah, rabbil alameen. This is why we say the idea is to get there. Forget about shaitan's plot is to make us fight about what we're going to get in a place that we actually have not even reserved a seat in. That's the thing. You're planning your holiday to Hawaii, but you don't even have an airline ticket. Imagine. First, work hard to get the ticket. Then we'll talk about what we're going to do when we get there, inshallah. So the same applies. Work hard to get your booking. When you get into Jannatul Firdaus, you will see everything. Whatever you wish for shall be in paradise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you, you can actually ask for this. And I am telling you, you can ask for it. Kana ala rabbika wa'dan mas'ula. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with Jannatul Firdaus. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to work towards there. And trust me, we will be the happiest. The last part of that hadith says, Wala khatara ala qalbi bashar. What is in paradise has never even crossed the heart or the mind of a human being. So it's way beyond whatever has crossed your mind. Recently, I came across, you know, these little drones that they use to take photographs. Then they used to strap or they strap the medication on it and they send it to your house within a five kilometer radius, sometimes further. Now they have these drones that can carry 200 kilos. So you stand on it and it takes you up. Where do you go? I fly in the air to where I want to go. And I've got a little joystick in my hand and this is a reality. It's being used now on earth, in this world. And at the same time, they are trying to commercialize it to make it available for the public as a mode of transport. So the next time you come to this masjid, perhaps for taraweeh, a few of us might be having our little, uh, whatever they call, I don't even know what they call these, the hoverflies or something of that nature. And you would have a few of them parked there outside. And I hope those are the imams of the masjid that will come with those. <laughs> MashaAllah, tabarakallah. I think we've got the message. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. I want to end by making mention of a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the test. The test that I spoke about earlier. Those who don't believe, those who don't believe, they come up with weird excuses. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verse number 21 of this beautiful surah, surah al-Furqan. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَرْجُونَ لِقَاءَنَا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْنَا الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَوْ نَرَى رَبَّنَا Those who are not looking forward to meeting with us, speaking here about the hereafter, those who are not looking forward to meeting with us, what do they say? They say, why don't the angels come down to us to prove a point? Or why can't we see our Rabb and then we will believe? Well, once you see him, what's the point of saying, I believe? You've seen it. Belief in the unseen is what we are being tested about. So if you cannot believe in the unseen, how can you call yourself a believer? I believe because I know whatever Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam has come with, yaqeenan, I'm convinced that it's absolute truth. I'm convinced that the Quran is flawless. I'm convinced that the message of the Quran is amazing. It promotes the highest level of peace and the highest level of understanding and living, subhanallah. So Allah says, those, they don't even believe in the hereafter. Look at what they're saying. They're saying, okay, show me Allah, then I'll believe. Okay, bring the angels, then I'll believe. And in another verse, Allah says, even if the angels came, even if they saw Allah, they would still not believe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make our hearts hard. Whenever the truth comes to us, may we be from among those who believe. 
May we be from among those who turn for the sake of Allah. Brothers and sisters, Allah sends us signs every day, every single day. Signs to turn to Him, to get closer to Him. We are getting older as the days pass. We're not getting any younger. It is definitely about time that we saved ourselves from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by becoming better people for His sake, quitting our bad ways, increasing the good, and thereafter achieving the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. اللهم وبارك على نبينا محمد سبحان الله وبحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك